Hey guys. Okay, my hair is like destroying me today. I'm gonna wait for you guys to join. I'm just going live today to do a little bit of a Q&A and just talk about metabolic health. Like you guys are always, um, hey guys. Uh, I just was saying I'm going live to talk a little bit about metabolic health and just answer your questions some more. Sorry, I couldn't do a story today. I just, um, stories usually, like the stories that I do that are informational can sometimes take me like an hour, an hour and a half to do. So um, when I have time, I love to do them. Um, but right now I'm kind of pressed for time, just with fully nourished and everything. So that's why I haven't been doing as many stories lately and as many posts, but I'm super thankful for you guys for being here. I thought while I'm waiting for everyone to join, I have like a few of my favorite products here just sitting by the window. Sorry, I like feel like I'm putting myself together while I'm live just because I um, just had to jump on. Um, while, and you guys can ask questions at any time. This is a Q totally open Q&A, but I just grabbed some products to show you kind of what I'm loving and what I do with some things. So um, I just got a new one of these raw organic honeys. I love this for, I used to just use this as a face mask. And then my friend Sarah at Healthy Skin Glow she actually uh, recommended that I use it in her program um, using it for actually the morning face wash so I've been washing my face with this in the morning because it, you know you don't have makeup on when you wake up so you can just do something that's gentle and I've been using honey to cleanse my skin in the morning and it's been amazing I used a whole jar of this already so I've probably been doing it for like three months now and I just love using raw honey as a mask you can mix this with green tea to for like anti anti-inflammatory effects or aspirin that's another anti-inflammatory um, you can mix it with niacinamide um, there's so many things but honey's a great base because it's rich in enzymes it breaks down um, it breaks down uh, dead skin cells and enzymes and things like that so that's what I really like <clears throat> Um, there's a doctor, need to find the name, that said progesterone was as important, if not more important, than estrogen for breast growth. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so it is just as important. Um, I have a lot of women asking me, you know, how can you enhance your breasts, and how can you get bigger breasts, and there's a whole, like, underground community of women who, like, take all these things to enhance breast size. But I just want to, and this is not stepping on anybody's toes, I understand that every woman's body is really, really different but usually a healthy female body holds on to a certain body fat percentage because that's necessary for reproduction, right? We always, um, the body really loves to have a layer of fat on the midsection in the stomach because that's where the womb is. Um, that's where the internal organs can get quick fuel for, for you know, working. And then we also have a lot, tend to store fat in our hips and our thighs to a certain amount because that's where our, our body actually pulls fuel when breastfeeding. And then obviously our breast tissue um, does, you know, attract fat. Obviously our breasts are just big balls of fat. That's what they are. Um, I mean, they do so much more, but that's what they are like in physiology. So, um, when you are at a healthy weight and you have proper hormonal function, usually your breasts will develop. Um, a lot of times women tell me like, they'll give me either side of the story. They'll say, when I went on birth control, uh, I was flat as a board. And then when I went off birth control, everything just kind of like my hips got really wide. My breasts got really big. That happened personally to me. Um, I took birth control from when I was 16 or 17 all the way up until like 19 or 20 and I really had like a I don't want to say a little girl's body but I had not really looked like I'd gone through puberty and then when I went off the pill it was like immediately overnight I went from a size zero to like a size six um, and my boobs went from like a small b now I'm like a D or almost a double D so you know everyone's body reacts to hormones different and I think it really depends on when you go on birth control um, if it blocks your own hormone production this is just a long story to say that progesterone absolutely affects your breast growth because progesterone is a progestation hormone and you under you need to understand the function of breast yes they're beautiful they're fun whatever fun bags whatever you want to call them but they have a purpose, right? And it's to feed your baby. <laughs> so, you know, your body sees that as a very necessary thing for reproduction, usually, and, and it breast size doesn't really matter when it comes to breastfeeding, but 
bigger breasts do tend to produce more milk. So there, I think there is a correlation there. Um, and I do believe that progesterone is super necessary for breast growth. And a lot of women are low in progesterone. And so a lot of women that are underdeveloped or can't gain body fat, they do have smaller breasts. And this has to do with a metabolic issue and a stress issue, because remember, stress eats your tissues. And so um, you, you do need to focus on overall health. And usually your breasts will um, become their normal natural size at some point in your life uh, based on your genetics. But if you do have hormonal fluctuations, like for me, um, I've gone like up and down, up and down, like my breasts have gotten bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller so many times that I have like, like, 40 year old lady boobs. I just do. Um, and you just have to embrace it. So, you know, you do need to get to a point where you understand that the function of your body is so much more important than the aesthetic of your body. And when you focus on the function of your body, the aesthetic of your body will actually improve. So don't think that like, if you stop hyper focusing on the way that you look, you're going to, um, you know, never see a change in your body. Actually, it's usually the opposite. When you stop hyper focusing on everything that's wrong with your body, it takes a lot of stress off you. And then you can actually, you'll see a lot more body composition changes. So all in all, eat healthy and whatever size your boobs decide to stay, just let it be. Um, and yeah, but I see people that have low progesterone using it for breast growth. Um, do you still take one-on-one -on -one clients? Yes, I do. Um, unfortunately, I have a super huge waiting list right now. Um, uh, about 40 people are on there. So um, I'm really trying to, I my client ballot is full right now. And so, you know, according to what people have signed up for program wise, like if someone has signed up for a three month program, then they're going to be done in three months. And then once they come to the close of their program, I can take on a new client and so on and so forth. And so it's going to take some time. If you want to be a one-on-one -on -one client, um, you can absolutely sign up for the waiting list and uh, you're going to be notified when a spot opens up for you. It's usually first come first serve, but I'm thinking it's going to be about six-ish months or so, honestly, but I'm going to try to get people in as much as possible. You know, I'm really, I try to be really good about taking on too many clients because once you get to a certain point, you start to, your, your abilities start to wane, you get tired and burnt out. And so you can't be the best practitioner you want to be. Um, so I try to, um, find a balance with that. So yes, I still take one-on-one -on -one clients, but I'm not taking them right away right now. Because I've had PCOS since teens, I'm the actual only one that never developed boobs until I took the pill, which suppressed androgens and gave me synthetic progestins. Okay, not the same as progesterone. Yeah. Yeah, um, boobs. Boobs are hormonal for sure. Do you think there's a correlation between healthy periods and healthy relationships? Just a fun thought I was having. Absolutely. So, hold on. So, there's evidence that... I don't know if you guys follow Allie at Empowered Autoimmune, but she was talking about how the birth control pill can actually affect your ability to choose a mate because remember, like we choose mates based on pheromones and pheromones send signals to our own body. Usually it's like our immune system and our genetics are in those pheromones. And so usually you are attracted to a mate that's going to kind of be the balance to your weaknesses. So if you have certain immune weaknesses or, or genetic weaknesses, you're usually attracted to a mate that has very strong genes in those areas. That's how it's supposed to work because then when you mate, you reproduce, and so now you've really outbred a lot of those weaknesses. You know, his strengths have overtaken your genetic weaknesses and vice versa. And so obviously the pill completely affects those pheromones because it kind of shuts them down. Your immunity, your um, vitality is shut down. And so your ability to really be in tune with your pheromones is completely different. I also find this is the same with actual um, synthetic deodorants. So deodorants really affect the way that your pheromones um, are you know, the way that you are attracted to a mate. And that goes for males too. So if you're like attracted to a guy and he's probably like a douchey asshole and he wears certain deodorants, like that might be blocking some pheromones that would be saying like, keep it away, keep it away. So yes, hormones and healthy cycles absolutely affect um, reproduction. It is a well-known fact that women in ovulation are more attractive to the opposite sex. Um, and when you're in your menstrual phase or your the, the period part, part of your follicular phase, that's when you're bleeding, you're less attractive to mates. So um, just, you know, FYI, I mean, obviously, if you're honey, 
you know, loves you, it's still going to be the the same. But, you know, if you were, you know, talking to a stranger or a strange dude, like he wouldn't be as attracted to you as if you were in ovulation and you were ready to mate. And that's just biological fact. You know, it's not like, oh, poor me. Like I'm on my period. I'm bleeding. I'm not attractive. Like it feels that way, but it actually biologically is slightly that way. So, you know, it's just one of those things, healthy cycles and vitality and libido and energy and just your personality in general right like your vitality is affected by your health you can be like this ho-hum just like meh person and that's going to affect the person that you're attracted to and it's also going to affect what you take as a person right like you probably wouldn't let things slide if you were at your tip-top shape and you're like your snappity snappity self and you're like no way no way but when you're depressed or you're kind of just meh you might be like whatever I feel meh and so he treats me like meh and whatever you know so absolutely your health is totally going to affect the way that you attract and find and choose a a mate or a partner and um, your cycles are your fifth vital sign you guys so when people like talk about they're like I'm pretty healthy but I don't have a period I'm like you're not healthy at all (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you need to see your period and your cycle as your literal health. They are completely intertwined and parallel. And if one's not functioning, you need to understand that that's you not being healthy and vice versa. I have cold feet at night, especially when I get into bed. Why is the cold feet only at night and what does it mean? Um, this could be, so So I'm actually writing in Fully Nourished right now, like how your temperatures and the warmth of your hands and feet, like how you're going to actually be tracking your me- metabolic vitality throughout the program. And one of the things is you're going to take your temperature and your pulse, you know, when you wake up, after breakfast, and then um, in the afternoon. And I was just talking, I was just writing it down right now. So in the afternoon you want to see your temperatures rise based on your morning temperature. So let's say your morning temperature is 97.8, right? That's at the lower end of normal. You want, um, over the course of the day, you want your nutrition choices, your exercise choices, your uh, lifestyle habits, like getting out in the sun, getting out in nature to all affect your thyroid positively and raise that body temperature. And so over the course of the day, you should see those the temps actually increase. You should see the warmth in your heat production and your cellular function increase, right? And if at the end of the day or in the afternoon, you're seeing temps go down, that's showing you that your habits throughout the day are not metabolically supportive. That is not really encouraging a healthy thyroid function. It might be promoting stress hormones. And so by the end of the day, you're going to be really cold. You're going to be like a reptile. You know, you're not, there's no heat production going on because your cells are like, well, we don't have what they need. So they're kind of slowing down. And so this is not always like if you live in a really cold place or, you know, you're, you have cold air air on your feet that's a whole different story than if your like feet are freezing ice cold in the evening that shows that's the farthest from your thyroid right so t3 is not making it to the extremities the tips of the fingers the tip of the nose the tip of the toes that's showing that um, there's not enough t3 to go around there's not enough um, metabolic thermogenic heat to go around and that shows a slowed metabolism so what I would do is like it's really hard to take it out of context and just say like you have a thyroid problem like it's most it's better to take your temp your pulse when you wake up kind of to keep track of that over the course of time then take your temps and pulse 40 minutes after breakfast to see if it rises and then so on and so forth and I'll be teaching guys how to do that really well in fully nourished but uh, it's hard to say if like cold feet really means a metabolic issue it could um, but it it doesn't have to when implementing progesterone cream how often should we use it and where are the best places to apply it yeah so I always say thin skin you kind of want to avoid fatty tissues because it can store up in the fat cells and so um, you know, a lot of people say like, put it on your groin area, like not, not in there, but like, um, just like in the crease of your hip or, um, some people will say like on your belly, but those are the places where fat tends to store most on women. And so, you know, you don't know if it's getting into fat cells or it's actually getting into your bloodstream. So I really try to put it on thinner skin, like the inner wrist or something like that. I use oral, so I haven't done progesterone cream in a long time, or you could do like the crease of your hip. So where it's bony, not like the actual, you know, the, the largest part of our thigh, which is, you know, going to have a lot of fat tissue. 
And then remember, progesterone should be used at the advice of your doctor. If you're doing it on your own, a kind of good rule of thumb is to do it in the rate your body's regular pattern. So if you're like kind of attempting to do progesterone experimentation on your own, which I think is fine. Like a lot of people are like, it can mask endometrial cancer. And I'm like, yeah, but low progesterone can also cause endometrial cancer. So like, let's weigh our pros and cons here. Um, and I think that you should follow the patterns of your body. So remember you ovulate around like day 14 to 18. That's when you start making your own progesterone. And then, so you want to maybe start taking progesterone therapy around there. If you're still ovulating, you don't want to take progesterone before you ovulate. Cause that can actually stop you from ovulating. So you want to wait until after you ovulate and then start uh, supplementing with progesterone up until you bleed. If you aren't ovulating, then you would just kind of go around day 14 and go all the way up until your next period. Some people will say to take it more than that, but I think you should follow the natural patterns of your body if possible. Are there any ways to reduce the look of stretch marks during pregnancy, certain creams, foods, etc.? Yes, so vitamin E oil is super great for um, preventing stretch marks. Um, what else would I use? I've never been pregnant before, but um, I'm trying to think of what I would use. Like, if I was pregnant right now, I'd be slapping on the creams. Shea butter is definitely something I would use. Um, vitamin E oil, which helps the skin heal rapidly. And then you want to make sure that you have enough of your fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamin A um, is, is you have high needs during pregnancy. I wouldn't take vitamin A. I would um, supplement with liver once in a while. Um, vitamin D from the sun, vitamin K, those are all important in skin health and skin integrity. And then you want to make sure your stress levels are low because the faster, um, the, the reason stretch marks happen, obviously there's stretching going on, but you're like, why do some pregnant women get stretch marks and some pregnant women don't? And it's their body's ability to heal, right? It heal quick enough to repair the damage. And a lot of women don't have enough nutrients to repair the damage. Um, or they've grown too rapidly and it just, you know, it, a lot of people will say it's genetics. It's not genetics. It has a lot to do with skin integrity and just how healthy you are as an individual and how healthy your cells are. Um, but yeah, vitamin E and shea butter would be what I would use. Um, you could also apply um, vitamin A topically, but that can be absorbed. So you'd want to be very careful with that. Do you recommend taking the Dutch test before starting the Fully Nourished program? Will it help with insight on nutrition for it? Um, you don't have to. I've designed the program to be a very like self-testing mechanism. I would actually probably recommend <laughs> that was a, it's a really good question that you, uh, you've asked. Um, I would probably recommend to actually get tested like six weeks after you've implemented um, the blueprint that is fully nourished um, or like six to 12 weeks if you're really not feeling better. But you're going to see improvements. And so as long as you're feeling better, there's no need to check your hormones, you guys. Like I, I think that testing is very helpful, but I don't think it's necessary. There's a big difference. And sometimes the stress of actually financially buying a test can be more stress than is actually worth it. <clears throat> so it's just important to weigh those pros and cons. It's, it's a great insight into your hormones. Obviously, it's wonderful to have a Dutch test to see where your starting point is. And I really love to do a Dutch test before a protocol I implement with a client and then six months later. But at the same time, um, if the financial stress is going to be too much or you're like, man, do I really need it? You don't. You don't have to test, you guys. Blood tests, urine tests are all really fun parts of living in the modern world. But people got by for thousands of years without them. And we're still here to talk about it. I'm getting a lot of varicose veins as I get older. Is it hormonal? Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it could be due to blood pressure. It depends on how old you are. Like, if you're saying, like, I, you, you're acting like you're, like, getting older. Like, oh, I'm becoming ancient, and I see your picture, and, I, you know, I've talked to you in the DMs, and you don't sound like you're that old. So um, if you're, like, in your 20s or 30s and you're getting varicose veins, there's usually a problem. There's stress going on. It could be blood pressure related. It could be vitamin K related. Your blood could be really thick. Sometimes when stress hormones are high and thyroid hormone is low, your blood gets very thick and it can really stretch out that vein. So um, there's a lot of reasons why varicose veins can happen. And I just really hate when doctors are like, oh, it's just you getting older or it's just a thing or it's just genetic. I'm like, mm, probably not. There's usually a reason the body does everything. <laughs> um, and uh, circulatory integrity or um, the health of your circulatory system is very interconnected with your hormones. So stress hormones, because just think 
think about like if the body's under stress it obviously needs more oxygen more nutrients and so blood is going to pump faster through the body in order to provide those things and so if that's happening chronically which we never want to happen but is what's happening in our modern world that's when problems start to happen like the body starts to break down because if you're going through nutrients rapidly you need to be consuming nutrients rapidly and so um you know, we start to see these weird signs and symptoms. Like I, when I was like really not doing well metabolically, you guys always probably think this is like a zit or a scar. This is actually a bursted blood vessel. And the minute that I can like take the time to make an appointment and get this um, saline injected so it can go away, I will. It's like a varicose vein on my face. And um, I've now learned that any kind of bursted blood vessels has a lot to do with metabolic function and the fact that your cells are under stress. That was just a long way to say, like, yeah, it probably could be hormonal. My boobs disappeared again when I got off the pill because I have no body fat. So frustrating. Yeah, I mean, getting body fat back on your body, you'll probably, um, you'll probably see your boobs get bigger. Speaking of the breast development issue, do you think hormonal imbalance and low progesterone could promote uneven breast size? Absolutely. Also, if you have like a really large breast on one side and not so big breasts on the other side, really like push in there. I'm not going to like do a boob massage on camera, but like, you know, go in there and see if that's a fibrocystic breast, just meaning that the breast tissue has become fibrocystic or has become hard and inflamed. Um, that can totally happen. Remember you guys, like I talked about in my live yesterday, the breast tissue is very sensitive, just like the thyroid tissue and the uterine tissue and the ovarian tissue. And so, um, you know, our dang reproductive organs, super sensitive, little delicate flowers, but they, the breast tissue is very sensitive. And so it can absolutely can contribute. Um, I can see how like rapid development in one breast could be affected. Um, I'm not saying that you could fix that. It might just be a thing that has happened and you're going to have to deal with, but you might see, I've, I've seen weirder things happen with clients. Like people will just say like, yeah, I used to have this like weird ringing and like whispery voice in my ear and it, like this is a real thing you guys not like an actual voice but like they can just constantly hear this like hissing noise and it's gone away or just like weird symptoms that their doctors have just dismissed that they've seen go away from just getting their hormones balanced so I've seen weirder things <laughs> Okay, I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions. Oh, constipation during the second half of my cycle. I'm trying some things that still need help. Yeah, so this could be like a slowdown of the metabolism. It could be a, um, a lack of progesterone. So remember, progesterone helps with bile flow from the gallbladder. So remember, guys, your liver makes bile. That's how it gets toxins out of the body. It's going to secrete that bile into the gallbladder, and then the gallbladder is going to secrete that into the small intestine. When food drops from your stomach into the small intestine, um, that actually the hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes in your stomach that get dropped into the small intestine tell the gallbladder to secrete that bile and then that bile goes with your digesting food throughout the digestive tract and helps digest and break down fats and proteins but also carries all those toxins that your liver was trying to get out of the body out of the body some of those bile salts are reabsorbed and reutilized by the body but a lot of the toxins and chemicals and things that your liver was trying to get out usually get out unless your body's reactivating them. And so progesterone and estrogen play a huge role in both those functions. If you're estrogen dominant, you cannot have proper bile flow. That's why so many women who are older are getting their gallbladders removed or have low gallbladder function. You can blame high estrogen for that because it impairs gallbladder release. And so usually when you have digestive problems, the last half of the cycle is this weird, there's this weird, weird myth going around that progesterone slows down your digestive system. That's actually not true. Um, it's like, Sometimes like nutritionists and dietitians hear rumors and they just like state it as fact and I'm like, no, 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 no. Estrogen can really slow down and cause inflammation in the gut and the digestive tract. And if you don't have enough progesterone to be anti-inflammatory in that case and help move bile flow along, you can get a lot of constipation. So my favorite thing for constipation is Cascara Sagrada. Um, it can be powerful and so you don't want to use it like if there's any problems, if you have any like inflammation in your digestive tract. Um, that's my first kind of favorite thing. You want to make sure it's aged. Um, and then uh, if that doesn't work, like aloe vera gel is really wonderful. Magnesium citrate can be used as needed. Um, and then you can always use coffee 
coffee enemas if if necessary to kind of clear that out because you want to be detoxing those estrogens if you're being constipated from ovulation all the way up to menstruation you are recirculating tons of estrogens and so whenever a woman's constipated they're toxic period their liver's not functioning properly their thyroid is going to be under functioning at the whole time they're constipated because remember you're just reabsorbing all the things the junk that's just sitting there so it's so important to make sure bowel is the bowels are moving whether that's you're doing it manually or you are um clearing constipation with like aloe vera cascara sagrada i think uh organic olivia has a good supplement called keep it moving it has like trifala in it which helps move the digestive tract along it also has cascara sagrada and a few other herbs cinnamon can also be really helpful as well as ginger um because they're uh, they help move everything quicker through the digestive tract track they help with motility um, those are kind of my favorites but yeah remember constipation can be treated short term with things that are more like have a laxative effect but constipation is its own issue it is a metabolic issue it means things are slow to move through which usually is based in cellular function and hormonal function and has very little to do with um, gut function also if you're eating tons of leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables that can really slow things down for sure Tips for endometriosis, is surgery an okay option? Yeah, so like when it comes to medical decisions, you guys, this is really, I always encourage you guys just to do your own research and trust your gut. There is no yes or no answer, no black and white. It's always a gray area. And it's always good to use Western medicine in cases that are too difficult to handle on your own. It's okay to take a medication. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're any less natural, right? You'd be stupid to not take advantage of the fact that we have the most modern medicine in the world it's just good to understand and make an informed decision that's what I'm passionate about is informed decisions not I'm not gonna do it unless it's natural decisions that's a stupid decision it's more I know exactly how this may affect my body and I'm choosing to do it anyways because I do everything else pretty healthily and my body's gonna recover quite okay so when it comes to endometriosis you have to understand that endometriosis has so much to do with estrogen and has so much to do with endotoxins from the gut it's usually based in severe gut dysfunction and severe inflammation I and this is not medical advice but aspirin is so helpful in endometriosis like seriously um, because it lowers prostaglandins and prostaglandins are responsible what's causing this extracellular growth you know scar tissue to grow all over the body and then estrogen is encouraging that inflammation because remember too much estrogen estrogen in the tissues is going to be pro-inflammatory but let's say you've already have has had too much endometrial tissue grow and build up then you know if surgery seems like a good option and you've gone to three or four different doctors and got multiple opinions because that's what I always encourage you to do always get three or four doctors opinions when it comes to cutting your body open that is something that always needs to happen I've seen serious horror stories from one person getting advice from one doctor who had some crazy idea or was on a, some weird ego trip that wanted to just cut someone open for whatever reason because remember doctors have incentives to cut you open that makes them a lot of money and so you have to really make sure that each doctor is aligning their stories are aligning if you're seeing different stories from different people like really different stories that should make you kind of check in your consciousness hmm maybe surgery isn't my only option but if all four doctors doctors are saying, you know what, I think surgery is the best option in your in your case, and you feel confident about it, and your gut is telling you this is the right thing to do, then absolutely, you know, so it's, it's really a case by case basis, I could never tell you yes or no, because it's such a personal decision. And I don't know what's going on with your health. Um, but yes, endometriosis is very largely based in the gut and with detoxification. I also think it has a thyroid component. I really do think it has a metabolic component. Um, the body's not detoxifying properly, which is is usually due to just under-functioning holistically on the cellular level. When PCOS and diabetes are both about insulin resistance, why are they different? Shouldn't everyone with PCOS who's insulin resistant mean they have diabetes? So diabetes is a point where you've become so insulin resistant you cannot burn sugar yourself or you've become so desensitized to insulin. Some women with PCOS do have diabetes, some women um, do not. And remember, not all PCOS is based in insulin resistance. Remember, you guys, I always talk about how insulin resistance is an effect, not a cause. 
PCOS is based in inflammation, estrogen issues, and low progesterone, usually also thyroid dysfunction. Remember, the thyroid is the third ovary. And so I don't think it has, and, and insulin resistance can be a result of that, right? But also adrenal issues can be a result of that, gut issues can be a result of that, um, uh, uh, what else? Um, high testosterone issues can be a result of that. So it's really metabolic dysfunction. I hate the name PCOS. It's just so inaccurate. Um, PCOS is just really a, a really serious case of metabolic dysfunction. And I really see a pattern amongst women with PCOS having a mother that had an underfunctioning thyroid. I do believe that women with PCOS were actually born um, and imprinted with a metabolic dysfunction from their mother. And it's not to blame the mom, right? More, most of the time our moms had no idea they had underfunctioning thyroids but remember we're the third generation of birth control babies right so our grandma's generation was when the birth control pill was first rolled out right so my grandma that was the first generation my mother was in my grandmother's womb and I was in my mother's womb so three generations was in my grandmother right me my mom and my grandma then my mom's generation was also usually just prescribed the pill for whatever reason. I know my mom was on the pill for five years before she got pregnant with me, and she got pregnant with me on the first try after the pill, which means that I was very much exposed to issues, and she later got diagnosed with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, and so we know that the birth control pill suppresses thyroid function, right? And so all these women getting pregnant right after they get off the pill, just snappity snap with under-functioning thyroids, are imprinting that low T3 syndrome onto their babies, and babies can be born with an under-functioning thyroid, you guys, and and this is why immune problems are becoming so prevalent in young children. It's because thyroid function and metabolic function absolutely suppresses your immunity. So I'm the third generation of birth control baby, right? And then I get put on birth control and it just makes my symptoms so much worse because here I was exposed to all these xenoestrogens. My mom had low progesterone because you always have low progesterone when you're coming off the pill. She had an underfunctioning thyroid and that was imprinted onto me. And so therefore, that is exactly what I struggle with to this day. And I think a lot of women are struggling with the same thing. They're just not realizing that it started when they were in the womb. And so in Insulin resistance, this is a long way of saying, sorry, I just get off on a tangent sometimes. Um, this is a long way of saying that insulin resistance is a product of metabolic stress. When your metabolism is under stress, your body actually begins to prefer burning free fatty acids over glucose. Burning free fatty acids is not a good thing, regardless of what keto diet culture is telling you. Your body prefers to burn glucose, but when it starts to get low thyroid function or low progesterone, it cannot burn glucose properly. When the cell becomes inflamed, it becomes resistant to insulin because why would it need a hormone that unlocks the cell and allows glucose in when the cell's not even gonna burn glucose in the first place? It's burning free fatty acids instead due to metabolic damage. So insulin resistance is a product of your your body's met metabolism no longer functioning properly. It really has nothing to do with sugar, and this has been known in the scientific community for 20 years. And I know that my view on this has changed. I used to say that insulin resistance is due to high eating too much sugar, but as you know, I've looked dig and dug into the science, and even in the face of my colleagues who are still saying that, I am now saying absolutely not that is scientifically incorrect. It has been known for over 20 years that free fatty acids cause insulin resistance and the body's m metabolic breakdown or the body's inability to burn glucose anymore makes it resistant to the hormone insulin. Ever since coming off the pill nine years ago, I still get crazy water weight fluctuations. Once or twice a month, my body swells, especially my hands and torso. Is this a progesterone problem? It can absolutely be a progesterone problem, and it can also just simply be a sodium problem. Remember that the more stress we have in our body, the more metabolic stress we have, the higher our needs for sodium and potassium increase. And sometimes our need for sodium is incredibly high. I'm talking incredibly high. Like you would have to just pound salt and you'll start to see, um, uh, because I should preface this by saying that remember insulin and hormones have a very huge role in how your body retains minerals. And so if your body doesn't have enough, it will retain as much water and as much, um, 
uh, fluid as possible to retain those minerals to keep you from peeing that out, sweating that out because your body is stressed. So something as simply as I like trace minerals research drops, potassium drops, they also contain sodium in them, um, can be very helpful with water retention issues. And then if that does not help, if getting enough sodium and potassium doesn't help, then you can maybe assume it is uh, more of a hormonal issue. Do you see many cases of PCOS women that are underweight? Is it harder to treat them and get them back to a healthy weight versus commonly seen cases? There's not really a common case of PCOS. Everyone really reacts to metabolic stress differently. It just really depends on your genetics and what your mother imprinted on you. So I think that every woman is going to react to the stress differently. Like under-functioning thyroid can cause a woman to be severely underweight or severely overweight. It's still the same metabolic issue. It's not like one is harder than the other. Sometimes one is more complicated than the other, but it's not harder than the other. So it just really depends on the person's health history, what they're struggling with what they're currently eating um because a lot of people have been on like healing journeys for a very long time thinking they're doing all the right things but they're actually like doing dabbling in this and dabbling in this and dabbling in this and they're really not sticking to something long enough for it to even make an impact on your body your body is a creature of habit and needs consistency and remember i always talk about the hundred day wait so what's happening now is literally affected by what happened to you three months ago Three months ago, the stress that you experienced three months ago is affecting your health right at this moment. A hundred days goes by. And so a lot of women come to me thinking like, I've been, I've been doing well for three months. Like I've been, you know, I'm ready for the next step. And they're like, I'm not really seeing any results. And I'm like, girl, a hundred days ago is affecting you right now. So you gotta be consistent. You gotta do the same thing over and over. And I know we live in this very, I want it now, very distraction style culture, but it doesn't work like that. And I wish it did. Like I wish I could give you a magic pill and say, you know, be healed, but it doesn't work like that. You have to do the work day in and day out and day in and day out. And it takes a lot of time sometimes. And you gotta be consistent. And so a lot of times people say like, I've been on my healing journey for so long. And I'm like, okay, what have you been doing consistently for the past year and they're like well I dabbled in keto for like a month and then I did raw vegan for like three weeks and then I did a juice cleanse for two weeks which I felt really good and I lost a lot of weight but then I gained it all back and they go on and on and on I'm like okay so you haven't done really anything yet you know so you have to see things clearly um your body's like really stressed out when you do stuff like that you need to stay consistently on a plan that is supporting what's actually going on with you and you got to do it for some time and it doesn't really take, it really depends. Like sometimes when you give the body what it needs, it kicks in right away and the body's like, yes, I've been waiting for this forever. And I see women improve very quickly. Um, it still takes sometimes six months to a year. I usually say, give it about two months for every year you've been sick. And sometimes that means if you're you know, 25 years old and you've been sick for 25 years, going to take a good a good amount of time it could take a couple years um, but you got to just be consistent don't look at that as overwhelming you just have to find something that's sustainable that you can do long term that's why restrictive diets don't work that's why taking a jillion supplements doesn't work because you can never stick to that long term it, it would be impossible and you would have to be superhuman to do that how to tell if it's amenorrhea or PCOS? I've lost my period before because of overexercising, but then got it back and lost it again when I started going through a hard time, but also have PCOS symptoms. You know, I think that sometimes it could be both. Um, uh, if it's hypothalamic amenorrhea, that's usually um, induced by overexercising, stress, and under eating. So if you're someone who has commonly lost her period, which it looks like you are when you're under stress, it could very well be amenorrhea. And the problem is, is like a lot of these PCOS diets or things that people are encouraging, like uh, you should, you know, cut all your carbs and you should do all this, which I don't believe PCOS, people with PCOS should do either. But um, the diet for PCOS that is being prescribed by a lot of practitioners is completely the opposite of what you would do with hypothalamic amenorrhea. And so it's just, you know, you kind of have to look at your health history. If you are someone who periodically loses um, their period under stress, then it might be hypothalamic amenorrhea. But honestly, like in my opinion, the treatment is the same. You've got to reduce stress on the body. You've got to flood the body with nutrients. You've got to support the thyroid, get the liver high, higher functioning. If you're under eating, you've got to get your calories slowly up. If you're um, not eating enough of a specific macronutrient, you've got to do that. So 
honestly, in my opinion, the treatment is kind of the same. And, um, you know, balancing your hormones and reducing stress is sometimes as simple as giving your body more sunlight, giving your body more nutrients, not moving so hard so, so much, not being so restrictive and just listening to your body. And that's usually beneficial for both hypothalamic amenorrhea and PCOS. But it's hard to know because they're very commonly the same. And you can sometimes see polycystic ovaries in hypothalamic amenorrhea because polycystic ovaries show up on almost any woman who's not ovulating. Just want to make sure I don't miss anything for the progesterone cream. If I don't ovulate until day 19 of a 28 day cycle due to low progesterone and thyroid issues, should I still wait until 19 to apply the cream? Yes, because remember the progesterone that you make now will affect how your cycle is in the future. So think of it, I call it the progesterone hangover. When you make enough progesterone during a cycle, that kind of, that hangs over into the first half of your cycle or that follicular phase. And it's going to affect the inflammation levels during that time it's going to affect the thyroid during that time and all of those factors influence how soon you ovulate and how much progesterone you make when you ovulate so it kind of is a chain reaction and this is why progesterone therapy can be so beneficial in the short term is because actually supplementing with progesterone helps you make more progesterone because your body feels less stressed, your cells are functioning better, your metabolism is functioning better, your liver's functioning better, your thyroid's functioning better. And so all those things are gonna impact how your corpus luteum makes progesterone. Does that make sense? So yes, you would still wait. It's gonna take some time, but you'll probably start to see yourself ovulate before then. Your follicular phase might shorten or you might see your luteal phase lengthen over time due to that. But I personally would wait until I ovulated or I would at least wait till like day 17 or 18 and give it a little time. Do you know anything about breastfeeding and sagging of the boobs? Yes, unfortunately, as much as our culture would like to think that the boobs are sex bags, they're actually breastfeeding bags. And so, you know, unfortunately when skin is stretched and um, then goes back down in size, there's going to be a little sagging. That is part of being a woman. I know that culture and society would like you to believe that that's an imperfection. It's actually a sign that you literally gave your child life for over a year probably. And so like that should be something that's celebrated and I don't understand why sagging boobs are, are seen as something as a negative thing. I think they're kind of hot like mom boobs are cute to me so um, I would not really worry too much however um, you know skin integrity is important so it's important to understand that progesterone and stress hormones do absolutely impact how elastin and collagen are produced in the body and how the integrity of the skin how the skin can actually bounce back you see that people that are not healthy don't really have very healthy skin looking skin they look sallow they look pale they look kind of like you know, I don't know what to, how to call it. Um, and then people that have um, healthy, like very bouncy, glowy skin usually are on the healthier side. So, you know, skin integrity does matter and hormones do impact skin integrity. So do nutrients, like especially your fat soluble vitamins, vitamin C, all those things totally affect your skin integrity. But then there is a point where you have to understand there's going to be a certain amount of sagging when your boobs stretch and then shrink. It's just, that's called life and that's the female body and it should be celebrated. It shouldn't be looked at as a flaw. I know this is such a general question, but what are some simple practical tips for losing weight if you have insulin resistant PCOS and adrenal issues? I feel like I'm doing all the right things. Yes. So, you know, this is a common question I get, but people have to understand that not all weight loss is equal. Equal. So a lot of people just think you lose weight, you lose weight, right? It's just the same thing. But you have to understand there's a difference between forcing. So when your, your fat cells can expand to about 10 to 15 times their size, depending on where they're located on the body, the stomach, they can expand larger. And then like, you know, um, the arms and the legs and things like that, can, they can only expand about 10 times their size. And fat cells jobs are mostly to store up glucose that was not burned for fuel. Remember that glucose is a very, very, very energy inducing thing. Um, contrary to what people are saying that fat is like a, a metabolic generator, sugar is actually where it's at when it comes to energy. But sometimes when the body can't efficiently um, burn sugar because it's such an energy producing thing, it requires lots of nutrients, right? Because if you're producing energy, you need a shit ton of nutrients. And so if you don't have those nutrients, your body's very smart and says, mm -mm, we can't speed up that metabolism because we don't have what we need to sustain it. And so that glucose will get pushed into storage as fuel for later. And your fat cells will expand to accommodate the glucose and so on. And 
and so forth. And so when you start tapping into those fat cells, you want to open them up and burn that glucose and detoxify any toxins that were stored in the fat. Because remember, fat cells are also almost like storage containers. And when your body can't detoxify things efficiently, like your liver's not functioning well or um, your your colon's not functioning well, your body will, will either try to detox through the skin or will actually store toxins in the fat cells um, to protect you, really. And then they were gonna, the, their goal is to pull that, those things out later at a, at a later date when it can actually handle the load of, of toxins. And so what, when we run the, what we run the risk of when we lose weight rapidly or force weight to be lost rapidly or when we really uber restrict calories is we're forcing the body to quickly grab from the fat cells, which might sound like a good thing, but that causes tons of metabolic stress, right? Because you're, you're releasing tons of toxins. So if you want weight loss to be sustainable and to last, you really don't want to be focused on weight loss. You want to be focused on healing the metabolism and healing the, healing the body's ability to process glucose. Because in that case, your body will begin to pull from fat cells automatically to burn the glucose that was stored there so long ago. Because if your body and your metabolism is working more efficiently, uh, your body's need for glucose will increase. And your body has this really crazy biological signal to tell you how much to eat. It's called hunger. And when you're hungry, you should eat. And when you're not hungry, you shouldn't eat. And that is how we lose weight. We actually really don't focus on losing weight. We focus on eating foods that sustain a healthy metabolism by sticking to mostly saturated fat, staying away from industrial seed oils, making sure that every single meal is a balance of protein, carbohydrate, and fat, and making sure we're eating at regular intervals to make sure the body knows it's safe and fed and can burn fuel and doesn't have to store fuel. That is how we lose weight. We need to make sure we're getting plenty of sunlight, fresh air, movement, not too much, not too little, just move, do things that you enjoy, sweat in a way that you enjoy. Um, and then you got to make sure you're sleeping. Oh my gosh, you guys, like that is one of the most important things because we actually burn up a ton of sugar when we sleep if we're sleeping well. So those are the things that I'm really going to be encouraging you to focus on when you are uh, in fully nourished because I think that that when we really take our focus away from weight loss I think sometimes as women we fear that if we're not obsessed with weight loss We're not gonna lose weight, but it's usually the opposite If we just focus on our health and we just focus on the fact that we're gonna treat our body well Regardless of what it looks like usually the body ends up responding and your aesthetics do begin to change You start to see a difference in the way that your body distributes and stores fat You begin to see things become slimmer and leaner and your body will change It will go up and down as you heal your metabolism so that's why it's really important if you're really focused on healing and not just weight loss You need to give your body the space to do its thing on its own and not force things because once we start forcing things We usually end up going backtracking at some point in time whether it's a year from now six months from now You know two years from now we eventually will end up um, in a worse place off than we were before because our metabolism was never healed, right? So we go back to eating normal things, our body makes us binge, you know, all those things will end up in fat gain instead of um, just doing something slowly and sustainable over time that will last a lifetime. How to best balance carb sugar for healing metabolism, estrogen dominance, insulin resistance. I know you say low carb can damage metabolism, but too many is bad for insulin resistance, right? Yeah, so this is a very confusing thing. Um, it's very important. It's more important when, in, when it comes to insulin resistance to focus on making sure meals are balanced. And what I mean by balanced is you want to make sure that every single meal contains protein, carbohydrate, and fat. You never consume those things alone because remember, protein will lower blood sugar very quickly. Carbs raise blood sugar very quickly and then fats really make sure that you metabolize those sugars properly and so the best way to balance a meal metabolically I'm gonna be teaching that and fully nourished is to find foods that warm you up physically they actually warm your temperatures up and they get your pulse rate up and they get you metabolizing quickly you actually start to see healthy sustainable weight loss when it comes to insulin resistance one of the biggest lies like I was talking about earlier is that it's caused by sugar it is well known in the scientific community that um, it's caused by free fatty acids and there's this weird rumor going around amongst nutritionists which I used to be a part of which I'm like why did I not see beyond um, the dogma that was taught to me but 
uh, insulin resistance is caused by your body's inability to burn glucose because of metabolic damage, not because the sugar in itself is bad. The fact that, or, you know, blood glucose and insulin is high because the body's not utilizing glucose properly. It's burning free fatty acids instead. And so our goal is to make sure the cells are functioning better by reducing inflammation in the body, making sure our thyroid is optimally functioning by making sure our liver is functioning well. And then our body will begin to metabolize glucose better better, right? Lower stress hormones, and we won't see our, our bodies as resistant to insulin because our bodies will now be allowing glucose into the cell. So, so carbs do have a little bit to do with insulin resistance, but it's actually important to be more focused on lowering the stress that is driving insulin resistance. And this is all going to be talked about in Fully Nourished. I'm going to actually be doing a story on this soon. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but you do need to make sure that you're eating enough carbohydrates to where your blood sugar levels are staying stable and you're not getting super bad sugar or carb cravings. If, if by 7 or 8 p.m. you're craving every single carb in the book, that is the body Body's sign that something is off your body needs some quick sugar because think of sugar as just quick energy I'm 36 oh Danielle you're not old at all you shouldn't be getting varicose veins oh my god I get a lot of bruises I get where it comes from now <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get through all of these because I know I talk forever. I haven't had a period in over a year due to taking or 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 Elisa for endometriosis. I'm worried about my health, but scared to go back to pain daily from endo. Opinions and suggestions. You know, that's one of those things that. If I, it was me personally, I would really work on my health overall and not really focus on worrying about things that you can't control. And then if you get to a point in your life where you're like, I'm feeling really, really well, I'm going to maybe try to cut my dosage, talk to my doctor to cut my dosage in half and just see where I go and just kind of organically um, phase yourself off of that. But I would never just go off a medication like that ever. I would more focus on how can I really get my body to an optimal place and then maybe try to transi transition slowly off and see how your body responds and then you know the worst thing that could happen is you would go back on it to the full dose but um, that's one of those things that you really have to trust your gut and think about and if you choose one direction don't worry if you're making the wrong decision choose it and be done with it you know what I mean because sometimes we end up like we don't we make a decision but then we stress about the fact that we made this decision like what if it was the wrong decision like what if we should have gone there and like no 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 you make a decision and you go with it until your gut tells you otherwise don't sit there and marinate and worry about it but i hope that makes sense like there's no right answer in that it's more of like you need to kind of figure it out and work out what what is well for you and it could be that you're just going to focus on your health as much as possible while you're on this medication and then one day maybe decide maybe i'm going to try a little less and see how my body responds I want to lose weight, but I tried low carb for close to a month and not a dent. Where do you suggest starting when wanting to lose weight with PCOS and after birth control? Yeah, so I recommend starting not focusing on losing weight at all. It's all about healing your metabolism and getting your metabolism opt optimally functioning because when you focus on losing weight, you will always lose a little weight and then you're just going to gain it all back because focusing on weight loss just doesn't end up with anything at all. Focusing on health always ends up in long-term benefit, not just weight loss, but also mental clarity, libido, um, energy, personality, drive, uh, sleep, moods, digestion, everything. And so it's so much better to put your time and energy into focusing on healing your metabolism than focusing on losing weight because you're just going to end up being really frustrated and because the body can't be forced to lose weight. Like who do we think we are? Best ways to detox estrogen. The best ways to detox estrogen is to make sure you're getting enough protein, saturated fats, and sugars every single day, and then you got to make sure you're eating enough salt. Those are like the main basic foundational things. If you're not getting those things, no amount of milk thistle, um, glutathione, vitamin C will make a dent in estrogen detoxification because your liver needs those things to function properly. B vitamins are also a huge deal. So this is why I always encourage my girls to consume liver regularly, whether that's in the form of desiccated liver, if they can't handle a liver, or actually doing some grass-fed beef liver, even if it's just ground up and combined with their ground beef. You know, you don't even really taste it. So it's really important to get those B vitamins in because the liver is like, dude, I need B vitamins for sure. And then um, then you can start to focus on like individual therapies. Collagen and gelatin and bone broth are incredibly therapeutic for liver health. Um, herbs like cilantro and parsley cooked into a broth can be really helpful. Magnesium, 
And then after you get those like basic foundational things figured out, you can always add in things like um, milk thistle and dandelion root and that kind of thing. Like those are always helpful, but you really want to make sure you've gotten the basics figured out. A lot of people come to me and they're like, my, I can't get my liver to detox for the life of me. And they're like on a raw vegan diet. And I'm like, "Mm -mm, your liver's like, I can't do anything. What's a way to relax enough to poop daily? Sometimes it's hard to relax. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a bigger issue than just constipation. So if you can't relax, there's a stress issue going on. Are you eating enough sugar? Are you eating enough salt? Um, Are you living in an environment that makes you feel stressed out constantly? Are you in a relationship that stresses you the heck out? Um, Are you anxious about the job that you're going to because you hate your job? Like that's definitely something where you have to dig deeper. Why are you not relaxed? Is it your pelvic floor itself that's not relaxed? Because if that's the case, then you have to actually actively work on relaxing your pelvic floor, which takes actual active effort. Um, you actually have to like tune into those muscles. There's three of them in there and relax like the internal inside the vagina at the entrance of the vagina. And then there's one kind of near the anus. And then you have to actually actively relax those muscles and can sometimes be harder than it seems if you have serious pelvic floor issues or pain or digestive issues you've probably been tensing for a very long time so i would do some deep breathing exercises um i would also invest in a squatty potty or you can even just do stacks of books underneath your feet in a squatting position squatty potties are so amazing for women i'm like dude if i was going to invest in like one thing it would be a squatty potty because it totally helps with your pelvic floor issues um and it also helps you relax because it's very hard to not relax when you're in a squatting position like you should really try it um and i mean like not like a squat like a, a barbell squat but like a squat like squatting down so that is one of my favorite ways to get relaxation to happen um and then also like have a poop time i know this is like poop talk but have like have a time a designated time 15 minutes like if you have a morning routine where you leave for work at 8 30 you know you can't leave two minutes of time to have a bowel movement like right before you head out the door it's not like gonna really aid in relaxation so you should maybe like drink some warm lemon water when you wake up go outside get some deep breaths get some sunshine in your eyes and then have 15 minutes where you literally go sit on the pot and and use your squatty potty and even if you don't poop during that time do it every single day for two weeks your body will get the picture i promise that's what i do with my um clients that are chronically constipated and it's due to like inability to relax or sometimes um, women have had anxieties surrounding poop because their mom you know praised them when they were young for pooping so there was a lot of um anxiety involved in that there was a performance needing to happen or there are also some children that were shamed for pooping like oh you're so dirty you're so yucky which is horrible to do to your children you guys because it can actually um encourage chronic constipation throughout the whole life so you can think back to as a child did you have a traumatic experience regarding pooping like your mom really praised you and it became a performance activity or your mom shamed you for it and it became a very shameful act either one can really be detrimental to your whole life and you actually have to work through that damage of of um having any weird emotions regarding poop like it was ingrained in you as a young a young girl that pooping was like a a a, a, like a performance activity when in reality it's a natural biological function that should just happen and not be celebrated or anything negative regarding it so um you have to kind of do some digging it's like some personal work yeah like it's so crazy some people are like yeah i mean i had to dive into like my poop history in order to deal with my chronic constipation <laughs> any advice for my man's hormone bpa hard to about hard to abound these days Yeah, I mean, I would love, I actually have in the works, like, I want to talk about, like, how to support your man's hormones without him actually, like, having to do much. I want to do, like, some kind of, um, something regarding that because I think a lot of women worry about their men, but then men are like, stop it, I don't want to eat that, or, like, I don't want to do that. So I've been trying to work on some simple ways that we can support the health of our men and and their testosterone levels without them having to do much or having to change too much, um, or to transition them slowly to a healthier diet. I know a lot of women would be interested in that. So the biggest thing with men is that they need to be eating enough. Um, You know, men tend to be higher stressed. They don't deal with their stress. They don't really take care of themselves very much. And so what I would do is just slowly, like, do things where you, like, the tasks that would fall to you, you can start changing. So you can start changing the body wash that he uses. Say, do you mind using this bar soap instead of this bar soap? And he might have an opinion, and you can say, can we try a few and then find one that you like? Um, Do you mind? 
mind just trying this deodorant out and if you don't like it I'll you know I'll get the one that you want you know just just kind of you don't have to be like you're using this and they they tend to get a negative connotation regarding the changes that they're making so just you know explain it to them say you know I'm just really trying to clean uh, everything up I want to really you know eliminate chemicals from both of our lives for the health of our kids or whatever it is and then um just do it and uh, do the things you can control so like your laundry detergent the things that like the candles around the house like the things that are in your immediate environment that you both partake in change those things first and then maybe start to change like if he puts coffee meat in his coffee maybe say can can you put some half and half and some sugar in your coffee instead like just make tiny little upgrades that he's not going to really notice and maybe we'll even like more but then at the same time we're going to be really effective at changing his health um okay so instagram's cutting me off right now it's giving me the minute signal but you know i i can't help myself and so i'll go live for another hour um or at least 30 minutes or so to finish answering questions so if you guys asked a question and it did not get answered just join me in a second and i will answer i see the one about oregano oil so i'll answer that next